Hey, good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Two years ago, I was an attendee at this conference, uh, where it was also a lot smaller. Um, so my name is Matthias. Thank you for the introduction. I work at a little company called Travis CI, uh, which you may know from, from these two people, or you may, may have seen this icon below. Um, Travis CI is a continuous integration and delivery service, but I don't really, I'm not here to talk about a product, but more to talk about a couple of anecdotes of things that we do, how we work, uh, and things like that. Uh, just for some context, Travis CI started out as an open source project, and most of it still is uh, developed out in the open. Uh, important context for what I'll be talking about, because we try to drive it like that um, now and for the future, and we have tried to, to run it like that for the last couple of years. Um, at the very core, we're a business that's rooted in Berlin, Germany. Um, but what you will notice is that I will talk about cultural difference in this talk. Um, they're very much at the core of a distributed system, especially when it's spanning the globe. Obviously, if you have a team of Germans that is only distributed across Germany, you won't have that many cultural differences, although you know, some might argue that even in Germany it would be different. Um, some of the examples I'll be talking about focus on uh, European and specifically German uh, comparing it uh, with U.S. culture. Even though they're both Western cultures, they, they do have very, very stark differences, um, even though they're really similar. Um, and this talk was created from materials and a survey that I've done with the entire uh, Travis CI team. So you'll hear a lot of quotes uh, from the team, and a lot of the input I've collected for this came directly from my team. Um, so just for some context around where we are as a company. Currently, we have 40 builders who are uh, located in eight different countries, uh, speaking nine different languages, and coming from a total of 15 different home countries. So there's a lot in there, which also means there are a lot of cultural differences in there. Um, about 50% of our team works remotely. That always shifts around because some people, some people work as nomads, some people move from the US to Berlin, for example. Um, but the, the, the important thing is that the workflows, we, 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 the workflows that we work with are uh, focused on supporting remote teams. So even when you're in the office, um, you know, we encourage you, we, well, we try to foster a remote work culture. But the split of 50% wasn't always like that. Uh, in our earlier years, when our team was smaller, maybe 10 builders, that was 2013 and 14, um, we had about eight people uh, who were in Berlin and two to three people who were in the US and one in Poland. And it just so happened that someone from the US moved to Berlin, uh, someone from Poland moved to Berlin, and suddenly we had a large presence in Germany, which actually turned out to be a problem because we have a large customer base in the US. And we couldn't give them uh, a good on-call experience when, there's production experience when there are production issues, we couldn't give them the best support experience. Um, so in early 2015, we started pushing for a more remote team, and we started hiring remotely. Um, and the other point I'm, I'm including here is that uh, our push for remote was also about increasing diversity. And how are how those two related? Um, there is a first quote from someone from my team. Distributed teams increase the chances of diversity due to having people from different cultures and backgrounds. Um, and this is especially true when you hire beyond your own country. Um, there's also a codified way of expressing this from my good friend Jan Leonard, um, which basically says, uh, increasing diversity requires you to build, to focus first and foremost on an inclusive company culture. And in the context of, uh, of this talk, I've extended this a little bit. Uh, distributed teams also need an inclusive culture. So therefore, building a distributed team helps you improve, uh, improve and increase diversity even further. So today I want to talk about two challenges that we're facing with. Obviously, these are only two of a, uh, of a very large set of problems, but I only have so much time in this talk. Um, I want to focus a little bit on how we communicate, um, and then I want to focus on culture. And when I talk about culture, I don't necessarily mean company culture, but bridging cultures. Uh, company culture is a part of this, engineering culture is a part of this, but even bridging the uh, US and German cultures can be an interesting challenge. And I want to focus on both a little bit. So starting off with communication. We don't have a very peculiar set of tools that we use. We use GitHub and Slack first and foremost. And using chat and GitHub issues and pull requests is a very natural 
combination because of our roots in open source. So we've stuck to those, um, well, until now, and I don't see us moving away from them anytime soon. We use very little email in the company, which is not really by design. There are no guidelines to tell you that you shouldn't be sending emails. Um, but it's more something that's grown organically. So everything we do either happens in Slack or in GitHub issues and pull requests or in a Google Doc. Um, Slack is mostly our virtual water cooler. It's where everyone says good morning, where everyone gets a nice emoji reaction, and also where we do enjoy the occasional animated GIF that a customer tweets um, about their build not, not, <laughs> not passing on Travis CI. Yes, uh, Slack is our, our core tool for, ace, uh, for synchronous and ad hoc, ad hoc communication. I think at this point we have about 180 channels. We create new channels for new projects that we work on. Uh, every team has their own channels, uh, sometimes multiple channels. And there's an abundance of internal channels, such as one for cats, one for dogs, um, where we just share those kinds of pictures. Um, but beyond you know, animated GIFs, because like, who doesn't love those? Uh, we use it for more practical things too, like uh, deploying. Uh, you know, it's like uh, these days, uh, the kids call it chat ops. Uh, we just call it interacting. You know, we just call it deploying to production. All of our stack, or most of our stack, runs in Heroku. And in this channel, which is called you know, deploys, uh, everyone can deploy to staging or to production. And having all of this located in a single channel uh, isn't just very convenient. It also helps increase visibility on what's going to staging, what's going out to production, just ge in general, what gets deployed and where. Um, but it also helps remove barriers, uh, especially for new and junior developers who don't have to learn any complex workflows, who don't have to do any, custom, any complex setups on their local machine as well. So very little setup required, only need to configure a token, and that happens through a Slack, uh, a Slack bot workflow. So it's very easy to set up. Uh, another channel that we actively use is called Incident Response. This used to be called Panic, uh, <laughs> which, uh, which got changed by initiative from someone from the team, which I'm very happy about, because the last thing you should do is when there's a production out is just panic. Um, so this channel has a very high visibility to the entire team when there's a production issue. Uh, there's open interaction between our customer support and customer success teams and our engineering teams to keep our customers updated during outages. And when there's a bigger outage, written communication can become a little bit of a hassle, so teams generally switch to open video calls, where also anyone can join. Uh, and written updates are still posted to the channel, so there's a, uh, a paper trail to follow. Um, yeah, that's our, that's our Slack use. It's not very particular, but it's, uh, it's one of our core tools, especially in a, in a distributed team. Uh, the other tool we heavily rely on is GitHub, uh, probably more so than anything else. Uh, we organize not just code, but also to internal discussions uh, around GitHub and GitHub issues. Uh, we have internal issue tracking for work in progress and for backlogs, nothing very uh, special about that. But because we're an open, uh, an open source project, you know, this is our API, which is an open source project on GitHub, everything we do happens out in the open. And there's one benefit of having a distributed team and being an open source project and having workflows like this. Uh, when someone in Europe starts, uh, you know, stops working at the end of the day, they, just not just, they don't just put down work, they hand it off to someone else in a different time zone. So we try to, we try to work on a fluent handoff between time zones so that someone you know, on the other side of the, of the Atlantic can pick up the work. Um, but we don't just use it for, uh, for code and for code-related things, for code reviews, discussions, and all of that. Uh, we use it also for onboarding. Everyone who starts working in the company um, Gets, gets a ticket, gets a GitHub issue, which has a checklist in there. You know, these are all the things that we go through. Um, in the first week, you know, there's uh, internal onboarding. You get your new hardware. Uh, you're introduced to the internal guidelines, and then you start working with your team. Um, it's usually going to be the first weeks. The important part about this is, and I don't have this on the screenshot, uh, what is also included in this issue is a very, very specific schedule for new, people, uh, for new builders joining the company. For your first two weeks, uh, everyone who's joining the company will have a clear outline of what they're going to be doing and who they're going to be talking to or working with. Um, and for engineers, uh, during their third and fourth week, usually we onboard them for customer support as well. I'll be talking about this a little bit later. Um, 
Further than that, we use it as a procurement system, I guess you could call it, uh, to book conference travel, to book any kind of travel, basically to uh, buy remote equipment, say you need a new screen, you need a laptop, or you need a new phone, or a coffee and tea subscription, which we do give to our, our remote employees, or like in this case, books. It's one, one of our few perks is you can, uh, we'll buy you as many books as you'd like because uh, we do like reading books. Um, and we have one, one repository for our office where we track internet connection upgrades because our internet connection in the office is really shoddy. Um, it's a, a German thing, I'm afraid. Um, and we have another issue where we track incident response learning reviews. So after, after we had a production outage, uh, a new GitHub issue gets created where we track timelines of what happened and possible follow-ups as well. Um, the benefit of keeping all of this in GitHub issues say, versus, say, in emails that you, know, you just send out to a group of people is that they create a lot of visibility. Uh, this kind of visibility can help people opt into what they're interested in. So on GitHub, that's very easy. You start watching a repo or you subscribe to a specific issue thread. Um, but the downside is if you have a lot of repos, like we do, a lot of projects where, which have separate issue trackers uh, and separate code bases, that also can create a mess. So uh, not just a mess, but also cognitive overhead for, uh, for everyone on the team to, well, you can't expect them to follow all of the repos and all of the discussions that are going on. Um, generally, we try to keep as many of these discussions out in the open and in GitHub issues. Doesn't always work as expected, but that's what we try to aim for. Um, one specific repository I want to talk about is called How We Work. Um, and this is where we discuss cultural and process changes, for example, you know, engineering related, developer related, though those that now have a separate repository and a separate issue tracker. Um, just as a couple of, couple of examples of discussions that are going on in there, uh, one is open about open, uh, open salaries in our company and externally possibly as well. Another one is about increasing diversity, um, internal and external codes of conduct, and also about our on-call rotation. Um, so all of these discussions are kept either in this repository or say in a new one for uh, engineering related things as well. So I've come to consider or call this a continuous integration for company culture. Um, you know, we're not just in continuous integration platform or product, uh, we try to apply it to as many angles of how we work and how we run the company as well. We assume that nothing in, their com in our culture is fixed, uh, everything can be changed and everything is evolving. And obviously it doesn't always work as quickly as one might like, um, but I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. One example of uh, longer, longer discussions are our company values. So this is a discussion that started two years ago um, to figure out what are our actual company values. Well, what do we, what do we, you know, what is, what is the standard that, you, that we hold each other to? Um, and what are we trying to live in the company? And over the year, this has been open. Uh, this discussion collected 70 comments uh, and had 18 participants. And, I mean, it's not, not everyone from the team, but back then we were also a little bit smaller, but it's, it's a pretty significant discussion um, where everyone had the opportunity to chime in, and in the end, we came out with a set of core and aspirational values for a company. And so this discussion took about a year until we finished and closed it. Um, it's a great example of uh, what I consider uh, inclusive decision-making, uh, which basically means that in these kinds of discussions, everyone has an opportunity to chime in, but they don't have to. You know, as, you, as you saw here, there are 18 people, there are probably some missing, um, but some of, these, some of these people contributed very, very heavily to the discussion. Um, the, the term is inspired by uh, a decision-making model that Red Hat uses. Uh, it's I, I first read about it in the book called uh, The Open Organization. I think since last year, Red Hat actually open sourced that decision-making uh, decision process on GitHub. Um, but I would also recommend that book anyway. Um, so this kind of inclusive decision making and hearing as many, uh, many perspectives as possible um, benefits directly from having uh, a diverse team. Uh, to have people with very diverse backgrounds, but with very, well, I don't want to say diverse opinions, uh, but diverse backgrounds and just diverse views that they contribute to a discussion. Um, even though they take longer, the result will actually be better. Um, the 
One, you could consider a downside that bringing these discussions to a conclusion can take longer, um, and also that these discussions are never fully done. But then again, we're trying to live a motto of continuous integration for company culture, where everything is evolving. So, you know, we don't consider it that big of a problem. Um, the bottom line of what I just talked about is that distributed teams uh, do have to work a lot harder to include everyone in discussions and in decision making. Uh, it requires a lot more effort uh, than talking face to face to make sure everyone is and feels included in a distributed team and in an inclusive team. Um, and it means that face to face communication, whether it's uh, in a coffee shop, in the office, via, uh, during lunch, or during a video chat, needs to be translated into written form so that others on the team uh, know what's been discussed and know what kind of decisions have been made. Um, but then again, we're an open source project, and this kind of work is the norm in open source. So why not, why not try to build it to run a company like that? Um, there's one thing that plays nicely into Nick's talk yesterday, uh, which is even more important for uh, distributed teams. It's from David Marquet's excellent book, Turn the Ship Around. Has anyone read that book? Okay, more people should read that book. Um, he said, and I've been, I've been clinging to this, uh, to this uh, ever since I read the book, don't move information to authority, move authority to the information. In a distributed team, you can't always wait for your manager or for someone else uh, on the team to wake up, uh, because, well, because time zones. Um, you can't always wait for someone else to help you with a decision. And so that means as, you know, as management or as uh, generally people working on a distributed team, um, you need to give that kind of authority to the people who, say, work on a production outage. They need to be able to make quick decisions without waiting for someone's approval. And that's especially important in a distributed team. As we learned yesterday, it's also important in working in very productive and healthy teams. Um, the challenge there is to find the right balance of problems that require broad input, like company values, much you know, strategic topics, much, uh, much higher value goals, much higher value discussions but giving away the authority for smaller and more focused discussions to make them autonomously. So if I were to sum up uh, communication, written communication specifically, it's this wonderful quote from someone on my team who said, less oral, less oral communication means more accidental documentation. Meaning because so much already happens in GitHub issues or in Slack channels, things are already written down. And it's a lot, it's a lot easier to turn all of that into documentation. This has been a challenge for us, and over the last two years, we've been working hard to collect everything into documentation, and we're just now finishing up that process, uh, creating a builder's manual, where we even document internal memes, uh, document internal Slack responses. Um, and the effort there was all, all teams had their own wikis, uh, GitHub wikis, they had their own documentation, they had their own means of keeping information, and the builder's manual is our collection of all of this information, basically, in a pretty standard format. It's a Jackal-based site that's deployed on Heroku, uh, where all of our builders can log in uh, using GitHub OAuth. So you just sign in with your GitHub, uh, with your GitHub account, and you can access the site. Um, and in this manual, everyone keeps this information updated, whether it's run books or employee handbooks, meeting notes. Uh, it's, everyone can contribute to this repository. Um, so written communication is all well and good but it's not a replacement uh, for the value of face-to-face -face communication. Whether that face-to-face -face communication happens via video or in a coffee shop or uh, sitting, sitting next to each other. So once a month, we run in all hands. And I'm trying to figure out when this was because I'm wearing something very weird. <laughs> but um, So during this all hands, we, uh, we, celebrate, we celebrate achievement through shout outs. Uh, it's a very recent addition that we made uh, where people can you know, send a shout out to someone or a group of people on the team. And uh, teams talk about their recent milestones, what they've shipped, and what they're planning for the next couple of months. Um, another recent addition to you know, finding ways to, well, to spend time face to face with each other is continuous improvement talks. The very, very recent addition uh, that came from someone on the team. Uh, continuous improvement is one of our company values. Um, and so this was a great idea to turn it into a series of talks where people can talk about, say, our API. How has our API came to come to be? Uh, how has it evolved? Why, why is it the way it is? And continuous improvement talks is like they happen bi-weekly. 
Uh, and they're all about sharing knowledge and collective learning. Because, because we're distributed, we don't have a means to do brown bag lunches, especially not because of different time zones. So these are basically the chance for everyone to come together when, if they're interested in the topic um, and share knowledge and learn. One recent example was uh, our, our customer success team uh, introduced our new support tone and style guide. Um, and once a year, we bring everyone together in person. Um, this was last year's, last year's Builder Bonanza, as we call it. Um, and that's usually a very intense time because some people meet uh, other people for the very first time in person. Um, but it's really, really good fun. So summing up communication, a distributed, team, a distributed team's biggest challenge is to make that communication inclusive. It can be very, very challenging to live in a distributed team, especially when you make, want to make fast decisions. But you know, I introduced some frameworks uh, that we try to live by uh, to tackle that kind of problems. And discussions can stretch out over a very long time. You know, our company values took a year. I think we have discussions that have been open longer than that. They just never stop. And that's all right. So the second part I want to talk about is culture. And you know, as I said earlier, I don't want to talk about company culture. Um, I want to talk about how you know, the, the challenges of bridging cultures. But I do want to talk a little bit about engineering culture and how that relates to having a distributed team. Um, most of our engineers are on call, like this person. Um, they, can, they can choose to be on call. We don't force anyone to do on call, but somehow, uh, most, if not all, of our engineers actually are on call. Um, and last year, we reworked our on-call rotation to benefit from time zones. So um, it's structured in a way that 6 a.m. in the morning, European time, or is it it's probably UTC because it's the only valid time zone. Um, so you know, in 6 a.m., someone from the, year, from the European side goes on call. They're on call for 12 hours until it's 6 p.m. Uh, European time. Uh, and then someone, someone from the U.S. goes on call. So it's an accidental benefit, or is it accidental? Maybe it's intentional, uh, of running a distributed team. Um, and why that is great is even though when someone's on call, sleep is very important. Um, the beauty of, uh, of having everyone on call uh, in, a, in a setup like this is that it also fosters learning because uh, people want to know as much as possible about you know, certain parts of our infrastructure, which is a very complex beast. Um, and it fosters documentation. We have our run books, basically, you know, playbooks for when something happens during an outage are ever-evolving. You know, one of the few repositories I watch is our builder's manual, and there's constant contribution to, to add new run books, to, to, update, you know, to update existing run books as well. And at the core of specifically production outages and managing them, we try to live by, or we aim to live by, a blameless culture. Um, that means uh, we assume that in a complex system, whether you know, especially in a system where technology, uh, computer software, and uh, humans, humans interact, there's always more than one contributing factor. There's no single root cause in this kind of system, and we try to, to, we try to structure the discussions around pro, uh, production outages in a way uh, that we don't blame people for mistakes or for the outages themselves. Because taking risks and making these kinds of mistakes are a very normal part of running a business. And so making mistakes is OK. Um, the beauty of a blameless culture, and this ties back to continuous improvement, uh, continue, a blameless culture fosters learning. Um, if you can brush aside the focus on a root cause, uh, you can learn more about how something happened and work to prevent it in the future. And another piece of engineering culture is that all of our engineers uh, work in customer support. So once or twice a quarter as an engineer on our team, you'll be talking directly with our customers for an entire week. Uh, the philosophy behind that is that everyone in our, uh, every engineer needs to feel both the customer's pain, but also their successes and their, you know, how they're using the product uh, with what they've built and shipped. And customer support itself is a very key part of our company and product. And you know, working, uh, having engineers work uh, customer support helps us break down walls between developers and the customers that they serve. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's also an important part of our onboarding. So you know, once you're done with your four weeks of onboarding, you, you're already, you're already be familiar with talking to customers, with the support tooling that we use, our internal documentations and, stuff like, and things like that. Um, the bigger challenge, however, when it comes to culture is working with different cultures. 
uh, which is a key part of diverse teams. It's trying to find ways to bridge them. Consider, for example, Germans and US Americans. I will focus on a couple of stereotypes. So, I, uh, so this is not exactly a, a German, but he's close. <laughs> he's, He's very close to being a German, quite figuratively. Um, you know, as Germans, and also speaking for myself as a German, we tend to be a lot more reserved, maybe also a little bit awkward. We don't do small talk. Instead, we go th straight to the point. We're going to tell you exactly what we think is right, or usually, more often than not, we're going to tell you what's wrong. Uh, so we're just, we're just more direct people. And, you know, that can be very startling, especially uh, US Americans who are very different. <laughs> Uh, they're more enthusiastic, and uh, you know they use words like amazing, great, uh, or awesome to describe things. And they're also a lot more polite. And you know this, I'm I'm not even joking with this because this is an actual an actual problem that we found uh, when you know Germans on the team communicate with uh, with with our people from the U.S. It's actually been part of the feedback that I've gathered in the survey that this kind of communication can be incredibly hard. Um, and just another example for this. Last year, we had uh, a little leadership offsite where you know, the facilitator made us uh, work through an exercise of trying to determine where our team is on, you know, on different scales, communication, trust, and all of that. And so we had these three parameters, which were good, great, and needs improvement. And you know, as Germans, we're always like, well, yeah, this, this still needs improvement. It's all right, but it needs improvement. And so. The facilitator collected that, that feedback and he was like, holy crap, this is really, really terrible. Like, you're not thinking very well of your own team. And then later I learned that needs improvement is all, you know, when you look at a performance review in, you know, in, the, in the US work culture, for example, needs improvement basically means you're close to being fired. <laughs> well, um, well, <laughs> it's a very, uh, I actually found that very sad. Uh, because the German in me thinks on a different scale. Um, this is the German scale of rating. <laughs> so, you know, we, t we generally think that something like needs improvement is somewhere in the middle, you know? There's like, there's still okay, which is, which is still, you know, where you can work with it. And then there's, uh, all hope is lost at the end. Uh, so that was an interesting exercise of discovering cultural differences we did, we just, I, I even wasn't aware about. Um, and so on the flip side, you know, German words, are very much on point. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of German compound words. I actually collect these. Uh, I, have, I have a long list of the, the longest German compound words I could find. It's one of the great, the great traits of the German language. You can just use any words and put them together into one. Uh, English, on the other hand, is a very ambiguous language. Um, it is our company language, it always has been. You know, as an open source community, we interact with our community in English, with our customers in English, and we interact uh, amongst our team in English. But not everyone's a native speaker, which means that meanings can get lost. Uh, you know, as a native speaker, you can read things into what a non-native speaker said, say things like colloquialisms or hidden meanings, maybe even hidden meanings that, are, that only exist in your part of, well, your country. Maybe they don't even exist anywhere else. Um, and not everyone understands these uh, colloquialisms or hidden meanings. You know, myself, I've learned as many U.S. colloquialisms as I could from watching Friends over and over again. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you haven't done that, it can be really, really hard. Um, and further, if you're not a native speaker, English can, parsing English in real time can be an issue for non-natives. Uh, whether it's by video, where it's even more challenging, or whether it's in situations like this. which can be really, really stressful, you know, I'm speak, even speaking for myself, but trying to parse lots of, lots of written output uh, from lots of people on your team while they're typing or while it's, while it's scrolling through on the screen can be a real challenge. Um, and further, the last problem there is that tone and nuance get easily lost in writing, especially when it comes to emotions. Text doesn't convey emotions very well, or it can, depending on how you read it um, or how you write it. So there are lots of, lots of angles on how people can, you know, your text, your writing changes when you're in a specific mood, or people assume that because of your writing is, you know, because your writing is, feels off, your mood must be different too. 
Um, so the emotion can either be hidden in the text or it can be interpreted into the text. Um, but someone from the team came up with a very nice approach to handling that. It's like Hanlon's razor for distributed teams, uh, which says, never attribute to malice or stupidity that which is adequately explained by a missing perspective. So if you think that someone, you know, someone said something and they, probably, they maybe meant it, there's probably a perspective from that person that you're still missing. Um, so to bring this, uh, this stuff to a conclusion, I talked about a lot of our challenges to building a distributed and inclusive team, and I talked about a couple of our solutions. That said, these are always in flux as we try to find uh, new things that work at any given team size. And you know, new, going from 25 to 50 requires an entirely different way of working, especially in a distributed team. Uh, these things work for us. They may work for you, they may not. Um, and distributed teams as a whole, they aren't for everyone, uh, but they can help you build uh, a more inclusive and a more diverse company. And with that, I'm going to close with a picture of a raccoon because this is a very conference where I learned uh, about the awesomeness of raccoons. And <laughs> I will leave you with an offering of a snack. Thank you. <laughs>